unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Somebody speak in other tongues. Speak in other tongues. Let's worship the Lord. Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Somebody speak in other tongues. Speak in other tongues. Somebody speak in other tongues. Talk to God. Believe something. Believe something. Believe something tonight. Come on, somebody speak to God. Come on, somebody speak in other tongues. Name is Yahweh. Your name is Yahweh. You're a miracle working God. Your name is Yahweh. Somebody speaking out of tongues. Say, tell any boo boo, shut a la la. Rasa katala la 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 Rosatala <laughs>
if it had not been for the Lord who was always on my side. The enemies would have settled on us, would have drowned in the water. Souls are far and escape our hiding place in you the fowler's net is broken I have is in the name of the Lord. For I'm nothing without you, without you, you are the air that I breathe, can't live without you, without you.
You make a face to shine on me and my soul comes very well You lead me up Now cleansed and free Then my soul knows very well
Whatever you're going through, you can tell him, God, you're able. God, you're able. God, you're able. God, you're able. Oh, <laughs> 
something. Even if there is no reason for you physically, there is reason for you spiritually. 
He saved you. He consecrated you. He anointed you. He has kept you alive. Does somebody have something to thank God for? If you're a parent, you have something to thank for. If you're married, you have something to thank for. If you're a minister, you have something to thank for. If you are alive, you have something to thank for. Come on, somebody thank God. Let's read Psalm chapter 4, verses 2. Today I want to talk about um, the presence of God. Today I want to talk about the presence of God. I want to touch a very integral part of the presence of God. Because God has not called only men of God to function in that presence. And when I'm talking about presence, I'm not talking about his presence on earth simply. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God. Somebody say amen. I'm talking about the what? The manifest presence of God. I'm not talking about, oh, God is everywhere. Agreeably, yes, God is everywhere. If you say God is everywhere, I agree. Right now he's in the bar watching a guy drinking himself high and silly. But his presence is not manifested there. So, when I'm talking about that manifestation of the presence of God, it has degrees. Are you hearing me? The presence of God has what? Degrees of manifestation. To some people, yes, he's present with them, but he's manifested in bits, in pieces, in small degrees. And some people, when the presence of God is manifested to them in small degrees, some, instead of seeking God to understand how to walk in the anointing, some criticize the demonstrators of the Spirit. And when you criticize the demonstrators of the Holy Spirit, you cannot attract what you criticize. Praise the Lord Jesus. There's a difference between... A genuine heart that seeks to understand what it doesn't understand. The humble spirits that seeks to restore that which they see is fallen. And the critical spirit that seeks to judge. Because every time you're judging, you seek to show that you're better than the other. Like, I thank God I'm not on Facebook. Because I can't manage that pressure. It's too much. It takes a certain grace. Which many of you have? Me, I don't have it. And it's not bad that I don't have it. Oh, good that I don't have it. Neither is it bad that you have it. Oh, good that you have it. It's only to the degree of what you use Facebook for. But many times, sometimes I see people send me a few small things of Facebook ministers fighting fellow ministers, eh? criticizing fellow ministers. And some may be a genuine. They seek to make right certain things. But... They float the principle of restoration and they think that they are doing truth. I'll give you an example. If you have an issue with a brother, what does the Bible say? Go to him. Is that what the Bible says? So how then do you start writing about a brother you have not met, firstly to seek clarification of what you think you don't understand, or seek to restore him such that when he fails you say, That I met this sister this day, or brother this day, and I tried to restore them, and failed to restore them, and that's now I write. Because you know the order? Go to a person, speak to them. If you fail, bring another witness. If you fail, bring a third. And the fourth time the Bible says, present it before the church of Christ, which is the body of Christ. Now, Facebook is like, quote unquote, a body of Christ. Sadly, it's not even a body of Christ in some way. Because there are people who are not born again. 
that people who don't believe in Jesus, they're not part of the Christendom. Are you hearing me? And I thank the way the Lord Jesus blessed the gospel. Jesus intends to tell you what is the truth. And then he lets you judge whether <laughs> you're standing in the truth or what is wrong. For example, if you feel you don't agree with somebody about something, you state what you believe. You understand? If you're really walking in love and you're seeking to restore and are not looking for your own or seeking to criticize another brother, you state truth and let people follow your truth. But don't ride on another man's success to become successful and you think that you're helping the church. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I see, I hear those things. That's why I said, I thank God that I don't what? I'm not on Facebook. It takes a certain what? Grace. So, I see people who criticize the presence of God. I see people who resist the presence of God. I see people who fight the anointing of the Holy Spirit. No man who is anointed, anointed themselves. Are you hearing me? Oh yes, we believe there are some people who are working under a certain power. But that's none of our business. Is it our business? Is it your business who is working under another power? No. Your business is to know him. This is eternal life. That you might know the one true God and his only son Jesus. And to walk your path, your course. Are you hearing me? And to relate with those you see. Walk a certain way like you walk. Are ready to believe a certain way like you believe. The Bible has too much to teach than wasting time on criticizing people by the way they function. The Bible says there are diversities of gifts by the same spirits. Diversities of operations by the same spirit. Diversities of administration by the same spirit. And the demonstration of the spirit, the Bible says, is for the prophet with all. In other words, if you resist the demonstration of the power of God, you are not profiting. The anointing profits. You might not understand how, but it profits. It profits. There are people I saw in meetings many years ago up till now, I still see. People who were hit by the power of the Holy Spirit and they woke up and they were different men. And the rest of their lives they followed another course. And then you hear somebody say, me, I don't believe in falling. Oh, you don't need to believe in it. Even us, we didn't believe in it. You understand what I'm saying? But because it's not given to you, it doesn't mean that it, it's not there. You understand what I'm saying? Because, of course, some push people. <laughs> I've seen people who push people. Let them push them. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but, Every believer must be a demonstrator of the Spirit. If you don't believe it, it's up to you. But if you believe it, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. One time, I was at a crusade ground and I found a lady with a child. And I said to prophesy on her life. I just could see in the Spirit that day. I thank God. And I could see, I saw the things she has been suffering, the things of her child. And this woman coiled literally. She coiled, huh? And then she started shaking. And then I went into her house. I saw the husband. And I told her how far long ago the guy had lost his job. Da, 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 da. And exactly why the guy lost his job. I saw things like which I saw many things. And while I'm ministering to this lady, the husband comes. And I had another friend. I will not say his name because now he's born again. <laughs> so the first punch went on my body. That guy. And he used to have a certain coat. <laughs> It was white, but it tended to cream. It was interesting to look at. I just saw a cream coat. Wah, wah, the guy ran. And you know, guys who pray a lot, you don't know how fast they are. Until calamity comes. I, this guy was fast. Because all I remember, you know, pew! I said, what in the world is this? Hallelujah. And this guy turns to me. And I could see in the spirit. That this was a demon, a Muslim spirit wanting to hit me. Literally, his face disappeared before me and I could see a demon coming to punch me. Are you hearing me? I say this one. Uh -uh. In a split of a second, I just remember as the arm was coming to reach my face, I said, devil, you can't hit me. And I remember the power of God carried this guy and threw him 
six or seven feet away. In the air, like, bah! He landed on the ground. And then he stood up. And he looked at me. My God, that day I felt like I was the strongest man in the world. I don't know where boldness came from. When he looked at me, I started walking toward him. I said, you want more? <laughs> he scattered. You need a degree of the demonstration of the power of God upon your life. It's the thing that gets tumors out of bodies. It's the things that get cancers out of bodies. It's that thing that can enter a man's blood and get viruses out. You need that thing. Tell somebody you need that thing. Because people have spoken. And we have spoken. And people can speak. And I've met men who can speak. And they can really speak. They have libraries full of books. And these books are full of exegesis and theological connotations and <laughs> something interpretations of how they know how. The gospel of Jesus is not mere talk. But it is power. Tell your neighbor it is power. I told you the Lord one time told me that we are entering a phase where people are going to start fearing Christians. Not in a bad way. Uh -uh. The things you do in the spirit scare. The way you demonstrate the life of the spirit is scary. The way you, you amass wealth is scary. The way you are healthy is scary. Everything is scary. It's not normal. It's scary. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. That is how we subdue. That is how we overcome the world. Because we are children of the Most High God. I refuse to be a normal... I refuse that. I refuse that. I refuse that. One time somebody called me on phone. And they put a metal on her neck. I was with uh, a certain member down there. She was with me in the same car. And she called me. They broke a little umbrella and put it on her neck. And they told her, tell somebody to send Airtel money right now on my, your mobile phone right now. Or I'm going to put this metal through your neck and kill you. Innocent little girl. So this guy wanted to put a metal on her neck. Put it, I mean, he forced her to look for somebody to send money on her phone. And the moment he does, he runs away with the phone. Or else he kills her. And I remember that day, I was driving back home. And the moment I heard, the girl calls me and says, he send money right now, they are going to kill me. I said, put that guy on the phone, the one who wants to kill you. They put the, so he says, the guy got the phone. He says, uh-huh. I told him, I'm giving you five minutes to give her back everything of hers, or else I'm going to kill you. He returned everything and walked away. <laughs> and that guy swore I was going to kill him. We don't need guns, hallelujah. No, 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 we don't need guns. We don't need bazookas. We don't need bones. Ah, no. We have a riba, kasa, katalaba, ye, sata, reko, riba, andori, katala. Our girls cannot be killed. Ah, your children will not be raped. Your daughters will not be raped. That will not happen. Not on your watch. The day they touch you. There was a time I was preaching about the flames of fire of the saints. Uh, there was a girl I remember that side of Kazo. You know the girl. And I was telling her that when you understand this thing burning on us. You see the Bible says a man cannot have fire in his bosom and his clothes not burn. It's not possible. No. You have to. There is a certain fire that burns on you. The Bible says he makes his servants as flames of fire. Whoever touches you touches fire. You can't touch fire. You can't touch fire. You, you can't 
touch fire. Those days of playing with us, they are over. No, you can't touch fire. Even Jesus on the crucifixion, the Bible says he gave his life. That means even if you're beaten, you're, it's by choice. But if you don't want to be beaten, you can't be touched. The Bible says he willingly gave his life. Willingly. He was not killed. No, he gave. So he wasn't a victim of circumstance. No, he was on top of the circumstances. He was on top. He knew what he was doing. He wanted to bring many sons unto glory. So there's this girl of ours. She was called Chirabo. Now she's, she's walking on the streets. And you know how these silly men stand on corners and say, like, I don't know how they do it. It takes a certain gift. So, so this guy said, he said, and then she ignores him and then she acts like she's walking her own. And the guy insisted, hey, madam, hey, he starts, this woman turns on this guy and says, Gwe. eventually, the story is very clear. Fire started to burn on this woman and this guy started to see this woman burning with fire, flames. And his head couldn't think whether to run or not run. He saw something that could stop him immediately. He went on his knees. He said, saying, this woman is burning with fire. There are flames. Now, people gathered. Everyone came and said, what's wrong with this guy? Is he running mad? So, no, no, no. He's not running mad. I'm just putting him where he's supposed to be. <laughs> are you hearing me? I'm just what? Putting him where he's supposed to what? To be. By the end of the ordeal, the guy was saved. They told him, never do it again. Ne- never do it again. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I have the presence of Almighty God. I cannot be a normal man in the name of Jesus. I refuse to live a normal life. I refuse. Because the presence of God is with me. So the issue is the degrees. The issue is the what? The degrees. For some men, it will take 20 minutes to do certain things. For others, it will take 20 years. Others, it will take 40 days. Others, five months. All in the same of the degree of the anointing, the presence operating on your life. Praise the Lord Jesus. In the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 9, the Bible says the Philistines, verse 2, sorry, verse 2, the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. Okay? And when they joined the battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew off the army in the field about 4,000 men. I want to show you something very interesting about this. And when the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Then they said, Let us fetch the what? The ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may call, save us out of the hand of our enemy. You see? I want to show you a huge mistake the children of Israel did. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And of the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, Phinehas uh, were there with the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistine heard the noise of a shout, they said, What means the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the camp of the Lord was coming to the camp. Right? Now, the Philistines were afraid so, for they say, God is coming to the camp. And they said, War unto us, for there has not been such a thing here to for. Woe unto us who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods. Do you see capital G? That smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. And the Bible says, but be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that be not, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews. In other words, even though they knew Israel was going to kill them, they would rather die than being slaves. I wish Christians are like that. Now, the Bible says, and so, next verse, verse 10. And the Philistines, the Bible says, fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent and there was a great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. With the anointing, with their presence, they were killed. 
there was a problem. Praise the Lord Jesus. And verse 11 said, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. At first, they are fighting without the presence. They are beaten, so they realize, if I have the presence, I will not be what? Beaten. So they go back, pick the presence of God, the ark, from Shiloh, and then they come with it. And they shout. And the Philistines hear that the ark of the Lord is with them. They knew they were dead men. Because they knew once the Israelite has his God in presence. You see, without the ark, they were believers in God. They were children of God. They had God in their hearts. But the ark represented the what? The presence. So the Philistines know that once the presence of God comes, we are in trouble. These guys are going to kill us, city. And these guys say, okay, instead of being slaves, we would rather what? Die. They fight. And amazingly, 30,000 men were killed, including the sons of the priest. The question then comes, how be that men with the presence are defeated? Do you understand what I'm saying? How be that men with the presence are defeated? Because it's not supposed to be so. It's not supposed to be so. It's not supposed to be so. And if you notice, they took the covenant box like it was nothing. You understand? These were non-believers carrying the presence of God. That same covenant box killed Uzzah for touching it. But at one particular point, the Philistines are touching it and it's doing nothing to them. They are stealing it. Are you hearing me? Then they take it somewhere. And it kills the men around. You understand? They take it in another place. And it kills the men around. The Bible says they were with it for about seven months. But the presence with the Philistines did nothing. Because they had a presence without a relationship. Are you getting where I'm coming from? What could kill a man for touching it? was carried by another man. And it didn't kill him. And then it settles in another place. And then it strikes the men of that land. And the guy carrying it again from that land to another land is not killed. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And then they place it in another place. And then it still hits them. And you realize once the Philistines had that thing, it used to destroy them. It never profited the Philistines. Until they threw it back to the Israelites. They took it to a house of a man called Abinadab. And for 20 years it dwells in the house of Abinadab. It does nothing. No miracle. No sign. No wonder. That same thing dwells in the house of Abinadab. Right? And the Bible says for three months his household prospered. And everyone around him in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Are we there? Uh-huh. 11. Can you go to 11? Uh-huh. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Abedadom, right? The Gittite, three months. Give me the Amplified. I want to read it in the Amplified. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Abedadom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Abedadom and all his household. And the next verse says, And it was told King David that the Lord has blessed the house of Abedadom and all that belonged to him because of the ark of the Lord. You see that? In one household, it is what? Blessing. In another land, it is killing. In another one, it is static. In Abinadab's house, it's doing nothing. In a Philistine's hand, they're even losing war. Same ark of the Lord, but producing different results in the hands of different men. Because some know how to function in this presence. Some don't know how. Some know how to function in the fullness of the Spirit. Some don't know how. Some know how to increase in the things of the Holy Ghost. And some don't know how. Some even fight the very power that wants to engulf them. The very power that has to save them. The very Spirit that could have saved them, they fight. And some like Israel are losing wars with the presence. Some like the Philistines are having their own killed on their side. Like the Philistines. Some with the presence have no results, like Abinadab. But there are others, like Obed Edom, 
Same house, same act. The Bible says he prospered and everybody in the whole house prospered. There is a presence of God that can sit on you and start to bless everyone around you. Everyone around you. Do you know that there are certain men of God you come in contact with and your life changes for good? There are certain women of God you come in contact with and your life changes for good. And if you don't know how to walk with these things, the day you separate with them, you're in trouble. You'll have a downward spiral. I've seen it. I've been in ministry long enough to see it. Certain men detach and they die immediately. So you ask, were you living by another man's presence? (laughs) By another man's glory? By another man's anointing? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is possible for people to be blessed because of you. If you're in the university... You must believe that because I'm there, there are certain things that can't happen. If you're working in a business place, you must believe because I'm in that business place, there are certain things that can't happen. If you're in a church, you must believe that because I'm in that ministry, there are certain things that can't happen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. These guys are my witnesses one time when we got a mad girl from Butabika. Mad, mad. She passes out. The moment she gets up, she fights. They inject her. She passes out. The moment she gets up, she fights. They say, we don't know anything medically to stop this kind of thing. And Apostle Emma called me that day and told me that this girl was in Butabi. And I remember she was among the first people we ministered to the gospel. Many years ago, about eight or nine years ago. And I told these guys, I told them, you know what? Get her from Butabi because there is no solution there. Then they asked me and Apostle Emma, are you guys mad? This woman is beating everybody. And you want to even take away the opportunity she has for medicine. And you want to bring her to church. Are you mad? You see, when the Bible says the gospel is foolishness to them which are perishing, I know what it means. We took her to church. First day, she beat everyone. <laughs> And people noticed I never did a deliverance service on her. No, I was experimenting something. I was in experimentation mode. Are you hearing me? So I, didn't, I was not in the mood of leave her. You, spirity, go. No, I just didn't feel like doing that. No, I felt in my spirit, I said, if I preach the life of the spirit, if indeed I preach truth, she can't sit in this anointing and she's not restored. Cannot be. She sat in the first meeting. They were shocked. She was quiet every time I was preaching. And she would slap almost everyone except me and Apostle Emma. The rest she would beat. Papa! When she reaches Apostle, she kneels down. (laughs) The Lord, as faithful as he was, got all manner of madness out of that child's head by the power of the Holy Spirit. With no medicine. No sedative, no nothing, no relaxer. That is the God I'm talking about. Who can get it out without any man's effort? Somebody say, I'm anointed for this. Say it again and say, I'm anointed for this. Your child runs mad, you put them in a corner. Sort their brains and they go back to school. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are certain things you can't allow as a man of God. There are things I can't allow my children to be. I can't. I hear me. I hear it and I say, uh-uh. Holy anger comes in. And I say, no. My own substance can't be like this. They can't be like this. It, unless they choose to unbelieve. That's their problem. Hallelujah. But if you choose to believe. If you choose to believe. You'll see the salvation of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, we ask the question, why was it not working for the Israelites? For the Philistine, we know. They were not under the covenant. But the Israelite was under a covenant. Isn't it so? For the Israelite, he was under a what? A covenant. It had to work for the man under the covenant. It had to work. Like it worked for Obededo. He was a man under the covenant. And they had gotten victories before with the very box 
the ark of the Lord. They had gotten results before with it. But when you look at the way it's transitioning into different hands and the results, men were even killed looking into the thing that saves. You read the Bible. There's some guys who would look on it and they died. Immediately. The Bible says tens of thousands of men were smiting just looking at it. Just looking at it. A man dies. Are you hearing me? Now, the Bible tells us in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, of the boys of Eli, Phinehas and Hophni. The Bible tells us that they abused the offering of the Lord. I want to touch that thing very importantly. Because some people say, ah, okay, now me. Okay, those ones were judged because they were in the Old Testament. And I agree. (laughs) But what about Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Ephesus? He knows their works. He knows their commitment. Give me that. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 1. Verse 1. He says, And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And he says, I know thy works. He says, And thy labor. And thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou, how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and they are not, and hast found them liars. They, you, you see that level. And the Bible says, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. And the Bible says, nevertheless I have some word against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And the next verse says, Remember wherefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place. I will remove the candlestick. How many of you know the candlestick? If you read in the olden culture, in the pattern given to Moses to build a temple, the candlestick was a very integral, indispensable article in the house of the Lord. It dwelt in the holy place. And it had seven what? Heads. On which the lights sat. Okay, let me make it simple for you. If you light a candle, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I think let's read verses uh, 15. The Bible says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a what? A bush. But the Bible says, But on a candlestick it giveth light. The Bible says, and to all that are in the house. Did you hear that? House of what? The Lord. Not just the physical house of your home. I'm talking about the house of the Lord. When you light your car, you, you remember the scripture says, so let your light shine. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Praise the Lord. But it says, but no man lights a candle and put it under what? A bushel. He puts it on a what? On a candlestick. So what's the representation of a candlestick? The candlestick is this entity that holds the light. Or I get another word. When you light a candle, you, put, you have to put it on a candlestick. That it will give light in the room. Because one thing for a light to be hard or contained, or, or, no, it's one thing to have a light and it's under a bushel. It has to sit on a candlestick. And that candlestick is what lights the world. That's why in the next verse says, so let your light shine. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the next verse says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. Now that's an interesting thing. Why do you think when Jesus is trying to draw the issue of light and darkness and how the candle holds this light, he tells guys, don't think I'm come to destroy the law. He was ministering grace. eh? He was ministering grace. It's the ministration of grace. The ministration of grace. The ministration of grace releases a certain light of your spirit. And every time Jesus was ministering grace, these guys are like, I think this guy came to destroy the law. Because he's preaching grace. You get it? And he says, no, I came to fulfill it. Because they thought grace 
destroys the law. Grace doesn't destroy the law. Grace fulfills the law. Do you understand what I'm saying? The grace message fulfills the law. It doesn't destroy the law. But when the guy was preaching grace, they realized, ah, yeah, 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 this guy is coming to what? Read the chapters below. Above, sorry, you'll understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying. He was ministering grace. Praise the Lord Jesus. In Job chapter 29 and verses 3, I want to show you something important. Job chapter 29. Let's begin verse 2. Job had an experience. And I want you to read it. He says, Oh, that I were as in months past. You know, after the affliction. He says, Oh, that I was like in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. And the next verse says, When his candle, the Bible says, shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness. Before the guy was afflicted and went through all these things, he recognized something that every time success was happening, there was something shining on his spirit. And that happens for all of us, whether you know it or you don't. You have as much influence physically, as much shining you carry spiritually. That is why Jesus tells you, let your light shine. Because the more you shine in the spirit, is the more influence you have in the world. Somebody say amen. Some of you, your lights are too dim to get jobs. They are too dim to get married. They are too dim to build ministry. They are too dim to heal uh, cancer. They are too dim to live. That's why he says, let your light shine. Release it. But it must be on a candlestick. Proverbs 24. Praise the Lord Jesus. No, actually, no. Let's go, Job. Proverbs is longer. 18. Verses 5. The Bible says, The light of the wicked shall be what? It has the influence of a wicked man shall be what? Put out. And the spark of his fire shall not what? Shine. And what does the next verse say? And the light shall be dark in his tabernacle. And the candle shall he shall be what? Put out with him. When a man is wicked, when a man messes up in the spirit, what the Lord can do is he can, in that time, he just removes the light. That's it. And the man is gone. You see what I'm saying? When a man faces judgment, it's only because his candle or his light has been taken. You get my point? The more light in which you dwell, you see, the Bible speaks of how God dwells in a light which no man can what? Can approach. Now, you, you cannot approach that light if you're a man. It doesn't mean that you cannot approach it. It only means that you can't approach it if you're a man. In other words, you can't go to it in the flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We are spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I see men which worship in spirit, but not in truth. Then I see men which try to worship in truth without spirit, because they don't understand the order. Praise the Lord Jesus. You must understand the order. That's why many times I labor to explain the order of the spirit. Jesus said, I am the way, I am, and I am. He says that nobody gets to the Father except by me. Psalms 18 verses 28. I'm going to show you something. The Bible says, for thou will light my candle. He says, and the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And the next verse says, for by thee I have run through a troop. And my God, by my God have I leaped over a wall. Why is he having those experiences? Because he's a lit man in the spirit. And the next verse says, as for God, his way is perfect. And the Bible says, and the word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all that trust in him. The Bible says, the way of the Lord. I always tell you there is a difference between the ways of the Lord and the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord determines his ways. They are not the same. The way precedes the ways. Moses knew the ways of the Lord. You and I know the way of the Lord. Because you're a new creation. The Bible says, who has known the mind of God that he should what? 
This is, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. I don't know if some of you know. No, give me the Amplified of that. It's, it's, it's beautiful in the Amplified. He says, for who has known or understood the mind, the counsels and purposes of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge. But we have, listen, the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold, the Bible says, the very thoughts. He says, the feelings and purposes of his heart. We hold the very thoughts, the feelings and purposes of his heart. Then somebody says, ah, but me, I'm a Christian. I don't think that I hold it. You know why you, you don't hold it? It's very simple. There are things you can't access without understanding the order. The order is not experience and faith. No. The order is faith and to experience. You must first believe that you hold it and then you'll experience it. If you think you're going to first experience it to believe that you hold it, you're wasting time. You have to first believe that you have the mind of Christ. You hold his very thoughts and feelings. His very purpose. When you believe that you have it, it will start manifesting in your life. Are you hearing me? That is the principle of faith. You believe it, and then it starts to work in you. It's like somebody tells me, I, I read the Bible and I don't understand it. I'll tell you why you don't understand the Bible. It's because every time you go in the Bible, you read it as someone who doesn't understand it, trying to understand it. You will never understand it. Are you hearing me? Enter the Bible like you're a star. Read it like a professor, a graduated PhD holder in the things of the spirit. A partaker of epignosis, the advanced knowledge and complete which is in God. You see, (laughs) one time I mentioned something in the Psalms. Oh, I've mentioned it a couple of times. But sometimes I don't have the full articulation of the words that I need to use to explain to some of you the spiritual depth of certain things. When the Bible says that I've seen the end of all perfection, and he says, and your word became broader, right? He says, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad, Okay? Let me put it simply. You can't see the broadness of the word of God until you get to the end of all perfection. You get it? There are men who minister in the perfections of God. You understand what I'm saying? And they are satisfied in those perfections. But many don't know that there is an end of all perfection. As we know it. And that's the beginning of the broadness of the word of God. Because some people think that the word of God is subject to only the perfections of the spirit. The word of God is beyond perfection. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The broadness of the word of God is beyond perfection. You have to behold it to understand what I mean. That is why when Paul is asking the church, he says, pray for us that the Lord might grant us doors of utterance. Because it's one door to access, it's another door to utter. It's, I, I wish I could, when I, when I'm, now, if you have understood, it's a door open unto me. Some of you, when you read the scripture, that a, a great and effectual door has been opened unto me, but behold, there are many adversaries. Some of you think a door of financial breakthrough. You think a door of marriage. You think a door of, uh, a new job. You think a door of having children. You think a door of going to America. You think a door of a great and effectual door. Let me explain. For the Christian, there are two kinds of doors. The door to access and the door to utter. Have I made sense? For the Christian, there are two what? The door to access the things of the spirit. To enter the zone where things are unveiled. Apocalypse. Because once things are unveiled, the wisdom of those things is what gives you revelation. Understanding. And when that is attached to divine purpose, you will manifest God. God doesn't want you to just heal the sick. You know one time I saw a guy, he said, I'm going to do, hey, 
a, a luxury miracle. Because I know I can. And I say, this, this is... Listen, God doesn't do things because he can. That's the temptation on the Christ. If you are a son of God, turn these stones into bread. You think he could not turn stones into bread? He could turn stones into bread. But you see, the son of God has not the place to turn stones into bread without the holistic understanding of what is for turning stones into bread. That says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the word of God. You see, you are limiting me to turning stones into bread because there are things I can do to prove I'm a son. But there's a holistic revelation of the word of God and some of those things in there can't allow me to just turn stones into bread just to prove I'm a son of God. Everything God does is on purpose. Otherwise, you're giving heed to another thing. And then before long, you realize <laughs> you've lost God. Oh yes, the gift can stay. <laughs> you know, I learned this from this man, 74 years guy. He's old, 74 years. This guy has worked with God for so long. One time this guy made me he put me down and explained to me the difference between the gifting and the anointing. We think they're the same, but they are not. They are not. Yes, the anointing, the anointing fulfills the gift on your life. But the anointing is different from the gift. That's for another day. So, when the door is open for you to see unveil things, vision, wisdom comes to your spirit. God then wanted to end with you knowing. He wants it to come out of you a certain way. And that is why he grants you a door of utterance. In this world, you need only those two doors. To access and to give to the world what is revealed. The moment you can do these two things, oh, you'll enjoy God. Miracles are in there. Signs are there. Wonders are there. Don't you realize these signs shall follow? They just follow. All of these miracles, the signs and wonders the Lord will route through you, they will all be seeking to approve this one thing, that what you're saying is true. That is why he says, if you do not believe the words that I speak to you, believe the miracles. If Jesus needed supernatural power, you need it, sister. Some people think that they are going to minister without the supernatural power of God. When Jesus knew that he could not win men without this thing. If Jesus needed it, you need it, brother. You need it. And in heavy doses, he says, greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah again. Praise the Lord Jesus. So, Job was conscious that when the light is on you, everything works. When it's shining on you, everything works. Now he's telling the church in Ephesus, I'll take the candlestick. I'll take it. Oh, but these people are under grace. Oh, yes, they are. It ain't mean he'll burn out the candle. The Bible says a smoldering wick shall he not what? Burn out. He'll not burn it out. He just takes away the candlestick. He will not burn out the candle. He will just take away the candlestick. I don't know that you get my point. He will not get the light out of you. He will just take away the influence of that light. <laughs> the influence of that light. Do you know how many people can spoil if they were influential? Do you know there are certain people, if God just granted them the anointing right now, ay, yeah, 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 yeah. they would put on shades and come shining like Movie stars. Called all over. Why? Because God has anointed them. Some of you are talking to us because the light is not shining, Burundi. The day it shines. <laughs> Some of you, God is helping us. <laughs> You're here because you have problems. Let the light shine on you and you win a win one million dollar deal. Mama, you know, Apostle, I'm busy, you know. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, the one they're talking about didn't come. 
<laughs> the sons of Eli, I want to finish. I have like three minutes here. Oh, I wish I had more time. The sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, dishonored God. And the Bible says, every time an offering and sacrifice came, these guys, before the sacrifice would go on, they would say, the priest says, give him what? <laughs> His portion. And if they would refuse it, these guys would take it by force. And these guys would say, no, let us first give God his sacrifice. And after God has eaten, you, the priest can eat. You see, you see, you see, the priest receives after God. So when you read that it's a man after God's own heart, let me understand. Let me make you understand this. But, okay, let me make it simpler. God intends that he anoints you for purpose. And once that anointing comes, he takes precedence in everything. I know it seems like it should be common knowledge, but it's not. That many times when the anointing comes on our spirits, we easily steal the laurels of God. Okay. I'll give you an example. A man stands on the pulpit and says, Today I'm going to do something to prove to you that I'm a man of God. And I've seen many. And some can prove. And some have proved for a few minutes. Some for a few months. And some for a few years. And the next day they are gone. If you're ever put in a position where you need to prove that you are a man of God, flee. Flee from such debate. God has not called us to prove ourselves. He has called us to be approved unto him, not unto men. He says, study the word of God that you might approve yourself a worker unto God. Study the word of God that you might be approved unto God a worker, a man. You have to be approved unto God. You are approved unto God, not before men. He has not called you to approve yourself before men. God has not called you to please men. That's the thing. Okay. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons, had a problem. Eli had a brain. He could have stopped these boys. But he didn't. Oh, the things you're doing are wrong and that's it. He lets the sons fly as they are. Because he got to a point where he could not talk to his... Yet the man had a heart for the presence. Eli had a heart for the presence. In fact, the scriptures tell you, when he was told that all Israel is gone, and your sons are gone. He stayed alive. And the Bible says, and when he heard that the covenant was taken, he fell dead. Because he knew what the anointing could do. He knew that once the anointing is not there, I'm a gone fellow. That's what killed Eli. When he was told that the ark of the covenant of the Lord has been taken, he died. That means he genuinely loved the presence. But he tolerated men which abuse it. Don't tolerate anybody who abuses the presence of God. Don't tolerate anything that abuses the presence of God. Don't. Don't. Respect the anointing. Tell your neighbor, respect the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life. The first point I made, he comes on you to fulfill divine purpose. Not for you to show him off. When we were babes, we turned stones into bread. That is why there are some people who have the anointing, but they don't have the influence of that anointing. Did you hear that? Some people have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have the influence of that anointing. They don't influence much, even though they have the anointing. They can't influence much. Candlestick. Are you hearing me? You understand what I'm saying? Number two, don't compromise when a man is abusing the presence. Don't. These guys know me. I can laugh on anything, but anything that comes, that gets to the point where I see that a man is grieving the spirit of God, I deal with him immediately. 
even if it's your child, woman of God. I've seen parents who grieve the spirit with their children in church. You get in the church, you, this, even this kid is willing to see it. But hold on, hold on, come back, come here. Then you get the phone. Oh, have. You, you, you're playing with a baby. Oh, so you, you, you mean God gave you that baby for you to lose attention from him. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the anointing of the Spirit of God is present, how do you respond to Him? How do you respond to Him? That is why the Bible speaks of the humility of spirit. Outwardly, Moses was a very tough fellow. But the Bible says he was the most humble man on earth. Why? Because he beheld the very similitude of God. He beheld the face of God. God spread to him face to face. Everywhere you are and you sense the presence, honor him. Some of you, you like the church in Ephesus, they were laborers. They could design false apostles. They could design everything. They were, be, they, they used, they were busy guys. They used to serve. God knew their labors. They, he knew their patience. He knew everything. But they had lost the first love. They had disconnected themselves from fellowship with the Spirit. And some of you disconnect because you're so busy. You work a lot. You work a lot. You're so busy. Oh, how do you reconcile work and ministry? Very simple. These are two worlds. Live in the Spirit. Everything in the world will sort itself. Yes, we all worked too as a banker. I used to work 6 to 8 or 6 to 7. Or seven, 8, eight seven to 5. But it doesn't mean that we never used to demonstrate power. No, we, we used to demonstrate power. Because for me, at the test of the anointing, I know what to do. At the test of the presence of God, I know what to do. And I have learned this one thing. Don't ever get in a situation where you feel disconnected from the Spirit. The first love is Christ. When he tells them you've forgotten your first love, that means they became so busy in the gospel and they started to detach from God in a way. I see people who, they get in the choir, somebody can play this piano and detach from Christ because they just know how to play the piano. Someone can start ushering and detach from Christ because they just know how to usher. Someone can detach from Christ because they're doing security. Someone can detach from Christ because they're in the choir. They become so busy perfecting voices and they lose the sound of the spirit. You get my point? When was the last time you sat with God in a room together and you found yourself weeping? Not because you have a problem, but because he's so good. His presence overshadows you. That's not an occasional experience where you go in when you're going to preach as a man of God. It is supposed to be a presently continuous experience. Wake up your morning with God. Go through the whole day with God. Finish the day full of God. And tomorrow, Lord, again. That same file. And keep it playing. I don't know if you realize those are like three points already. God has anointed you. You are full of the presence. You have the Holy Spirit. Start to relate to the Holy Spirit like he's a friend. Do you know how it breaks God's heart that you talk on WhatsApp more than you talk to him? You, you're on Facebook the whole day. The whole day. How do you even keep up? How do you do it? You're reading the newspaper. You're reading the latest news. You're reading everything in this world. And it's not supposed to be these cramped phrases of 3 a.m., 12 o'clock hour. I'm not talking about that. Praying always in the Holy Ghost. If that's an ancient man who has learned by experience to sense the presence. There are times, sometimes I'll be having a meal with friends and I'm eating. And the Lord tells me, excuse yourself for two minutes. I need to talk to you. And I just tell guys, let me come back. And they think I've gone to the restrooms. And something drops in my spirit. And I knew that was for the moment. Anything can wait. The psalmist says, I desired your word more than necessary food. Give God time. Give God time. Anything in this world can wait. Give him priority above anything in this world. Some of you, your husbands have become priority. Your children have become priority. Listen, oh, I have to pick the children. I have to do this. I have to do this. Yes, he gave them to you and they are a gift that's wonderful. But he did not give them to you to replace him. 
Oh, so how do I reconcile? You can do all things through me. First, get to me. I'll show you how to look after children and still stay connected. You understand what I'm saying? And then a person comes, oh, apostle, pray for me. I need, I need to get married. I want a man. Me, I'm afraid for marriage. It has failed. Woman, seek God. Get so consumed by God that if a man wants to find you, he has to first find God first. Hmm. But you're floating the order. You want marriage without purpose. There is a place you reach. See, that's why the anointing does. It breaks yokes. There is a place where you reach and certain things can't hold you. They can't. Why? Because you're too loaded. You've taken over lighter yoke, which is Jesus. Don't tolerate anybody who abuses the presence. Are you hearing me? Don't abuse the sacred things yourself. And give God time. Give him time. Hope me and fear us. Abuse the offering of God. They took a part before God took. They wanted to show that even though God takes, we have to take what we want before God takes. Why? Because we have the entitlement. We are sons of the priests. And the priests to come. Oh, don't you know that you've been made priest unto the Most High God? No. All glory goes to God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Oh, my glory have I given them. Yes, we do carry the glory of God. But you carrying the glory of God does not mean that you forget the purpose of why you carry that glory. The purpose of why you carry that glory is not to get attention to yourself. The purpose why you carry that glory is to lift him up. And he said, when you lift me up, I'll draw men to myself. That's why people come to prayer meetings. Some people think people come to Fanero because we excite people. We just tell them what they want to hear. No, sir. We rebuke some people and they go back face down and they still come back. Why? Because we leave Jesus. The more you leave Jesus, the more he'll draw men to himself. Pastors, pastors, leave Jesus. He will draw men to himself. If you see that you're struggling in your ministry, examine yourself. If you've been the faith. Sometimes there are things that have become tradition in your spirit. And those things take away the attention of lifting God. He has given us his glory. And I'm a partaker of his glory. I was glorified by the spirit. But because I must attach purpose to it, I know that this glory given to me is to bring him glory. Is to lift him up, not myself. The gospel is not for what is in it for us. The gospel is what for what is in it for him. Are you hearing me? It's that place where we understand that for, to have ourselves, we must lose ourselves first. Because if we don't lose ourselves, we'll never have ourselves. If we don't give ourselves to him, we'll never have ourselves. We cannot have ourselves until we give ourselves to him. Am I making sense? And that's the place where you will go to men who need you and act like you need them. Because you need to bring Christ to them. That is the point where they will abuse you and you're still going back to them because you know that they need God. And when they are born again, that's when they realize they needed you more than you needed them. But that wisdom to know the difference is what draws true Christianity from the falsifications we have in this generation that appear to be clouds that hold no rain. The love of God, the knowledge and judgments, the approval of things most excellent, that we might not have offense on the day of Christ. We are playing with so many things except dwelling in the presence of God. We, you understand what I'm saying? Purpose, he comes first. Don't compromise with anybody who abuses the presence. I get mad when I see. One time I, I was in Buddha, I remember preaching, and a kid starts talking in the back end. And I stand and I tell, hey you, who they are talking to? Haven't you been suffering from migraine headaches? This kid had migraine headaches. See the next week, he was talking with him. 
And I could sense that there was a spirit talking through this child to divert this other boy with migraines from receiving the word to be healed. I had to chase the one talking out. Not that I'm a tough person, but because there are places where you can't grieve the spirit. You can't continue because the more you grieve him, the more you start to reject him. Without knowing, you oppose and reject him. Many people are so rejected from the spirit that anything that appears to be spiritual, they fight. It's like atheists. I've never understood how an atheist can say, I don't believe there is a God. But then they have a problem with Christians praying. If you don't believe it's there, what's your problem with a Christian praying? Oh, we don't want people to shout for us. We don't believe in those things. You know the laws that they're passing in Europe. And I'm seeing a sign to creep into Africa. Oh, we don't want this kind of this. We don't want people shouting for us. We don't want, we don't want street preachers. Okay, if you don't believe that God exists, why do you have a problem with them shouting? If you don't believe that God exists, why do you have a problem with them teaching Christ in, in primary schools? If you believe it's nothing. They believe. They just don't know that they believe. Praise the Lord Jesus. Give God time. Create an ever constant experience of being one with God and feeling it and enjoying the presence. Every time you're in that zone, even if you didn't read the Bible or pray the whole day, like three people think that you have to read the Bible to be one with God or pray to be one with God. Sometimes he needs just silence. Just meditate and it's enough. But the freedom to know that whether you meditate, whether you speak in tongues, whether you read the Bible, it is not what you do according to the patterns of this world. It's what you do as the Spirit of God leads you. You're going to enjoy God. Raise your hands and speak to Him. Lord, I will worship you. To know the God that you are Lord. Come on, speak in other tongues. Two minutes. Lord, I will bow to you. To know the God that you are Lord. Can you take a minute and just close your eyes just for two minutes? Give, give God a minute. Anything can wait. Just give Him a minute. Just give Him a minute. There's somebody here. You, you are serving. You're doing things. You've been born again for many years. You served God. But there was a point where you felt disconnected. You're born again. Man. You could pass for salvation. Everybody looks at you and they say, Wow, this guy, this sister and brother is born again. But something detached. There was a way you used to hear God. There was a way you used to relate with Him. It's years since you were there. It's years since since you talked with Him a certain way. It's years since you felt a certain way. It's, it's years since you wept under glory. It's years since the angels appeared. It's, it's years since the Spirit really worked on you. I ask you tonight, give Him your heart. And now I want to pray for those people who are here and they say, God, I have tested and seen your presence, but I need to go to another level. right now in the name of Jesus may God start to separate you wherever you are at the sound of my voice if you say God I, I want more I want more I want more if you say God I, I have you and I know I have you you're, you're full of me but I, I want to see more I, I want to experience more I, I want to walk in the spirit more. I want to hear more. I, I want to function more. I, I'm tired of this level. If you're here and you say, God, I receive it. If you're here and you say, God, I have been in a situation where I, I'm, I'm in service, I'm praying, but I'm detached. 
and detached. I'm detached. You tell him I'm detached. Tell him God, I want to get connected to something that can disconnect that. And I want it to continue growing and growing. Power of the Ghost! Somebody needs to walk out different tonight. Stand. Come on, speak in other tongues. If you're a prophet and you're here. I see something coming. Whether you know it or you don't. <laughs> Power of the Holy Ghost! Lord, I will die to you. Receive it. To know I Receive it. Oh God, the true the Lord. Receive it. Receive it. Any problem on this ground. God is going to open your eyes. You're going to see and hear like you've never been there. Because your heart is for purpose. Power of the Holy Ghost. Receive it. Receive it. I see a demonstration of the anointing upon somebody's life of signs, miracles, and wonders. Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, separate that person wherever they are. Connect for good. That you enter an ever unceasing flow of the Holy Ghost. That it will not be in parts and pieces, in buckets and cups. But out of you, indeed, the manifestation of the rivers of living water shall flow out of you. And with whichever profession the Lord has called you, you're going to have influence. You're going to have success. You're going to have results. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. It's time for you to influence the world. There are people here, you're going to influence the world. Your influence is going to grow. And it will be with purpose. It's not lasting. No, it will not be self-centered. It won't be a selfish pursuit. It will be the real embodiment of the conviction of the Spirit of God to release you to a place where purpose is. To cause men to come to the saving knowledge. You will lift him up. Evangelists. This is your time now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Lord, I will bow to you. To know the God. But you. Father, we thank you. Because tonight your presence is not in vain. And it's operating on our lives from glory to glory. Wow. I feel it. I feel it. Heart disease is being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Kidneys are being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Blood disease are being healed right now in the name of Jesus. God use you. In the name of Jesus. 
disease is healing. If you came next to a sick person, tell them to check themselves. God is healing them. They in a walk will it will chair, tell them to walk out. They have a clutch, tell them to throw it. Somebody give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise. Give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, put up your hands. We want to lead you in a confession prayer. You say tonight, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Put up your hands and say tonight, I want to receive Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, wow, come. Those of you who have put up your hands, come and stand there. Come and stand there. How do you? Come and stand there. Please hurry. Can you run? Can you run? Can you run? Run to Jesus. Some of you from this meeting, you're going to start demonstrating the power of God like you've never done before. If you believe it, say, it's mine. Whether you're a preacher, whether you're not a pulpit, whether you're a worshiper, whether you're a simple businessman, you're going to demonstrate God. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, I don't care. You're going to demonstrate God. You're going to heal the sick around you. Cancers are going to heal in the name of Jesus. Somebody's tears have been taken tonight. You're not going to weep again. You're not going to weep again because of sorrow. You get the one who satisfies. Your light shines brighter than it did yesterday. The Bible says the path of the just shines brighter and brighter to a perfect day. Now, people who are coming to salvation, all of you who are confessing Jesus, can you repeat these words after me? Repeat these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive in my heart today. I believe that you died and rose again. And you're the true son of God who gave his life for me. Tonight my heart believes, my heart believes and my tongue confesses that you are Lord of my life. I'm born again. The message Amen. you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at Fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.